This is Movie Tone. Lionel Gamlin reporting. In spite of the nearness of the struggle, Caen was soon settling down again. The inhabitants were quickly finding out many of the advantages of British occupation. Food supplies were organised, and it wasn't long before American biscuits and French cheese and butter were being distributed. Much of their town has been destroyed, many of their homes demolished, but the French people can set against their loss the liberty which is so dear to the tradition of their country. After four years, they are free. Many of the homeless live in the cloisters of the cathedral, and central kitchens keep them supplied with hot meals. In the streets of the town, we found many of the men and women who had never stopped resisting the Germans. Men of the underground movement, dressed in uniforms which they can now wear openly. While the people of Caen were getting more and more used to the new way of life, there was good news for the armies which had fought so bravely to liberate them. The first consignment of British beer had arrived. Only a small beginning, it's true. Enough for each man to have one bottle each week. But it's a foretaste of things to come, and it is real English beer. The rations are collected by each unit and then distributed to the soldiers. The sergeant major hands it out himself. After all, it's a pretty important job to leave to a subordinate. Over on the American front, an incident which is being repeated almost daily. A Russian, fighting with the Germans and captured, promises to fetch his platoon. The Americans, suspecting a trap, are careful, but they finally agree, and off he goes down the railway back to the German lines. A 20-minute time limit has been specified, and before it's over, back he comes, complete with his pals eager to be done with fighting for the Germans. Now that the word has got round that we don't shoot our prisoners, quite a lot of them are getting their own peace terms this way. Anyway, in they come, and what's more, they bring their rifle bolts with them. In Cherbourg itself, one of the rewards of collaboration with the Germans. French girls who'd shown a partiality for the enemy have their heads shorn. Under German rule, such a crime would have meant instant execution or at best a long stay in a concentration camp. Under Allied rule, they get their hair cut. Our method is the gentler but thoroughly effective punishment of ridicule. Back to the British sector, where General Montgomery attended a church parade. The ceremony was broadcast, the general himself reading the lesson. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came... Everyone wanted to thank Monte for the great success which he and his men have accomplished, even the youngest of them. It was soon after these pictures were taken that the Great Offensive was launched, an offensive which took the British and Dominion troops out into the open country beyond Caen. Before the big attack could begin, two commanding positions had to be occupied. Hill 112 and Hill 113. The proceedings opened in true Montgomery style. Ah! Both positions were finally taken after desperate fighting and the stage was set for the big push. And what a push it was. From our bridgehead across the Orne, a corridor was driven into the German lines and through the corridor poured the British armour out into the plains south of Caen. Tank fighting country where once again Monty's armour can meet Rommel's panzers and fight it out. As the battle in Normandy reaches a new pitch of fury, we in Britain have no doubts as to the result. Montgomery has outgeneraled Rommel and the British soldier has outfought the German too many times for us to have any doubts. With the Russians at the gates of East Prussia, with Alexander racing north in Italy, with steady progress in Normandy, and with the trouble in the German army itself, Hitler's doom is sealed, and how well he must know it. <laughs>